सहनावतु सहनो भुनक्तु सह वीर करवाहै तेजस्वीनावती तमस्तु मिदावै ओ शांति शांति A human being, as we said, is constituted of a physical body, mind, and intellect. The body is just a vehicle. It is your inner personality that is guiding you all the time throughout your life. So, what we can do is to rehabilitate our inner personality. We can strengthen the inner personality. by virtue of which we can guide our life to achieve something which is beyond our understanding today see we have our own concepts right now about what is life why are you here in this world what are you supposed to achieve in this lifetime we have an understanding at the moment but when you read a scripture when we gain knowledge which is what we are attempting to do we realize that there is a higher purpose to our existence here and that every human is heir to this inner state of peace and happiness which is what everyone is looking for consciously or unconsciously directly or indirectly everyone is drawn to this original state of being it's something like this your original physical stature anybody's physical stature the original state is health that would be the natural state of your physical body but when your body is not in a healthy state when you fall a prey to disease what do you do when you have a fever or you have some physical ailment what would anybody do go to a doctor right so what does a doctor do what can a doctor do he gives you a prescription he gives you medication what do you think medication can do what does it do what does it do it cures when you say cures what does it remove it removes the disease it removes ill health that is what um, any medication can do a prescription a course of treatment can only help remove ill health remove disease what remains is your original physical stature which is health in other words no doctor no medicine can ever give you health why because that is what you already have you have lost your original state because of a wrong exposure you have succumbed to something which is not you which is not your original state and you can never be comfortable when you're not in your original state you can never be satisfied peaceful when you are in ill health you will constantly endeavor naturally to get back to health even if you postpone it even if you neglect your health you can't do it for long ultimately you will have to go and find a way by which you can get back to your original state 
because health is the original physical stature. Anything other than your original stature, you cannot be comfortable. Are you able to follow this? Because this is important. If you understand this, then we can go on to the next. Now, friends, your original state is divine. Your natural state is to be happy, peaceful, cheerful, joyful. This is what the original state of your mind is. Now, because of wrong exposure, because of ignorance, because you do not have that knowledge, what happens is you contact the world incorrectly. You succumb to the temptations and suffer. It's like mental ill health. We have been saying over and over again in this classroom that any form of agitation, any form of negative emotion, it could be anger, it could be hatred, it could be jealousy, greed, passion, envy, fear, you can add whatever you want. Any form of negative feeling is mental ill health, is not your original state. So you can never continue in that state for long. You'll collapse. That's why they say stress is a silent killer. What do you mean when they say it's a silent killer? It's a state of ill health, mental ill health. And if you neglect and neglect and carry on with your life without paying attention to that signal, that red light, something is wrong within. If you don't pay attention, a time comes, even physically you collapse. It attacks you, either the heart or the head. And then you have no choice but to rush to a doctor. So what does the doctor do? He suppresses the symptoms. He says, get away from work. That causes you stress. Go, don't go into the situation because you're adding to the problem. Till you are all right, stay away. And he gives you medication only to suppress those symptoms which are bothering you. Little do you realize that any physical ailment that you're going through is nothing but a reflection of your mental condition. There is a saying, as you think, so you become. Whatever way you think, you will become that. You think negative, all the time, you become a negative person. You think positive, you become a positive person. Whatever you think, so you become. So your life is in your hands. It is up to you to find out how to set the course of your life. And why would you throw away this opportunity called life? Why would you do that? You would do that only if you remain or you choose to remain ignorant of this great opportunity we have called human life. So coming back, your original state is to be peaceful. Anything apart from that is an unnatural state and you cannot last in that state. You can never say, look, I have a problem in life. I'm going through something excessively. I've got too much of it and it's bothering me. What is it? I'm too happy. You can never suffer from happiness. Your point is, I'm happy and I'm happier and I'm happiest. You have no issues if you are more and more happy. You just feel normal. It's just a normal state. And you can take on any amount of cheer, any amount of happiness, just feel normal, like nothing happened. But the opposite, if you are unhappy, if you are agitated, if you are worried, if you are anxious, anything apart from happiness, you can't take it beyond a point. 
Why can't you take it? Because it is not your natural state. So all that the scripture is saying, like we examine that dharma, what is your dharma? What is your essential nature? What makes you what you are, without which you are not what you are? It is the state of mental peace and equanimity, tranquility, happiness, cheer. So we've got to make serious attempts. We've got to commit ourselves to regain a state that we have lost. And that is why we use the term yoga. I'm only recapitulating what we have already done. The term yoga is derived from the Sanskrit root yuj, which means to join. And the indication is we have moved away. What have we moved away from? From our original state. I don't know how many of you are here for the first time, but there's a classic example that we often repeat just to drive home this point. I did start saying, everyone is looking for this one thing called happiness. You may do it directly or indirectly, consciously or unconsciously, but happy you must be. You cannot be satisfied with any other state except happiness because that is your original state. Now, where you're looking for happiness, you know. You've got to look for happiness in a place where it is, not in a place where it is not. And all of us seem to be looking for happiness in a place where it is not. That is what Arthur Schopenhauer, the great, the well-known German philosopher, he tells us, yes, it is difficult to find happiness within oneself which is what we're trying to do. But it is impossible to find it anywhere else. It is difficult to find happiness within oneself because it needs your effort. It is difficult to find physical fitness. Why? Because you have to go and sweat it out every day in a gymnasium. You've got to hurt yourself, as it were. It's not easy to be physically fit. But once you get the taste of physical fitness, you will never settle for anything less. Similarly, once you get the taste for mental fitness, you will never settle for anything less. But you don't know. You've got to find out where is true happiness and which way are you going. Check for yourself. That's what he's trying to say here. So coming back, that example, and I would appeal to those who have not heard the example, because it will help those people to understand what we are saying. Okay? Imagine a coil spring four feet high. I'm particularly addressing those who are hearing it for the first time. And those who have heard it before, just relax and listen. Okay? Don't be too enthusiastic to answer. A coil spring four feet high. You get it? No, you don't get it? Okay, a coil spring four feet high. I compress it to one foot. What do you think happens to my palm? Anybody? There is a pressure urging my palm which way? Upward. Okay, so I release it to two feet. What happens now? Less pressure. There is pressure, but less pressure. I release it to three feet. Still less pressure. Now, I release it to four feet. What happens now? No pressure. Why is there no pressure at four feet? Because it has reached its natural state. It's a simple example. Very simple. Coil spring, four feet high, compressed to one foot. Tremendous pressure on my palm, pushing it, pushing it upward. So I release it to two feet, less pressure, three feet, still less pressure, four feet, no pressure. Why? Because it has reached its original state. Now friends, you please examine what is happening to people. Everybody is going through pressures. Everyone goes, to, goes through stress. 
strain, worry, anxiety, and you have your reasons all written out. You know why I'm pressurized? Because of this. Because of what? Something outside in the world happening. I am pressurized because of that, because of my problems at office, because of my issues at home, because this is nagging me, this problem. You have your reasons for pressure which is outside of you. But nobody has stopped to think that you may be pressurized because you are not in your original state. And all your life, what are you doing? Going away from your original state because there's no attempt. There's no inquiry. Why am I born into this world? Why am I born a human being? You could have been born an animal, you could have been a plant, but why are you a human? What is the meaning of human life? And like we've already said, when you go, you're here, all right. But when you go, you take nothing with you, nothing. Not your name, not your fame, not your money, not your family, nobody, nothing, except your knowledge or your ignorance. Whatever you choose to pick up in this lifetime, and nobody can tell when you go. Even the speaker may not come back tomorrow, because we don't know. We don't know when we go. And people have this tendency, I don't understand the tendency. Anybody passes away, they feel it's the wrong time. Should have lived longer. And then they put little ads in the paper, you know, in memory of, in memory of. Not only that, this dear soul was snatched away by the cruel hands of fate. And dear, darling, whoever, we miss you, we miss you. 25th anniversary. Now what I don't understand, you also must think, when they put that in the paper, what is the understanding? Obviously, who is it addressed to? It is addressed to the departed soul. So you expect the departed soul to read what you have put there? You believe this paper is going to heaven or hell or I don't know where. That you have a message there. We remember you every time. You're always in our memory. People do it. For what? For what are you doing it? Who do you think is reading it? Absolutely steeped in ignorance. We don't know why we do what we do. So all that we know is when you go, you take nothing except your knowledge or your ignorance. Whatever you choose to pursue in this lifetime, that alone travels with you. Have you not heard of child prodigies? At a young age, the person can paint, or can sing, or can do wondrous things. There are children who can understand words, little ones, who can repeat words that you can't repeat, can understand the meaning. And you wonder, from where did the child get the knowledge? The child has not even gone to school. It must strike you that there is a carryover. Something is being carried over. Otherwise, you're just in awe. You're wonderstruck. You praise it and stop thinking. You've got to extend your thinking to understand and accommodate this phenomena that you take only your knowledge or your ignorance. So whatever you choose to pursue this lifetime, and therefore, the appeal here is Whatever else you may be doing, spend a little time every day to pick up that knowledge which you're going to take with you, which is going to help you in your life. This life and future, whatever it is, the only aspect in this experience that you're having called life that will help you ever is the knowledge of the truths of life. These are time-tested truths, referred to as sanatana dharma. 
eternal principles of life. They have been put to test thousands of years ago and proved to be correct. We are only examining it here in this classroom. We are trying to understand the truth systematically, scientifically, and this is the best approach one can possibly have to the truths of life. So you've got to find your way back to your original state. So the more you move towards your original state, less and less will be the pressures that you experience. So how do you know you are on that path? How do you know you are moving towards the original state? It has nothing to do with your experiences in the world outside. It has everything to do with your mental stature. The first sign of knowing that you're on the right path is this. The pressures that you presently have, things that bother you now, things that upset you now, things that can put you off track, will reduce its impact on you. That impact becomes less and less. And the frequency reduces. How often do you get upset? How often does it affect you? The frequency and intensity reduce. You may not experience the positive joy that we're talking about, which is your original state. A life full of cheer, full of enthusiasm. You know, wake up in the morning and you're ready to face the day. Nothing can stop you from being cheerful. Nothing in this world. No disappointment can stop you. That energy that you have every single day, no matter what your condition is, even if you're in hospital, you should have that feeling. Yes, even if you're in hospital, what does it matter? The body is going through some changes. Let it go through the change. They have to cut you up for something. Let them do the job. Why should you be affected? You got a little holiday away from everything. Enjoy it. No, but I'm sick. And people who go to hospital, the operation has not yet taken place. The fact that you have to be operated, they're already dull. They have to be put in the wheelchair and taken to their room. But you can walk. You walked up to the car, you sat in the car, you went to the hospital, but the moment you step into hospital, you need a wheelchair. Because you're drained out mentally. You feel you're weak. You are not weak. The mind is weak. The, when the mind is weak, body becomes weak. You have nothing to lose except your own peace of mind. And why would you throw it away? In a state of ignorance, you throw away what is rightfully yours, which is peace and happiness. So friends, we need to make an effort to get back to this original state. I keep repeating physical fitness because that is something you can understand. Now, unless you work out every day, how can you be physically fit? And when it comes to mental fitness, we don't want to put in any effort. You expect to be mentally fit without effort? You may sit in every lecture that you can possibly attend. You may read every book that you can possibly get hold of, but that will not help you develop inner strength. Why? Because you have to work on it by yourself, with yourself. That's the only way to do it. So it has to be a daily study. That's a must. You cannot avoid it. But if you are prepared to put in a little effort, it's a question of time that you gain this inner strength with which you can face any challenge in the world and maintain that peace and happiness and cheer throughout your life. So he cautions us, the first thing that you have to be careful about is what we concluded yesterday. He said, O Kaunteya, Arjuna, the turbulent senses, the first problem that we have is the senses. We don't understand you could become a slave to your own body, to your own senses, the demands of the body. 
You could become a slave. And he says, even a wise man who is striving on this path. So it's not just a person who is lost in the world, but even a person who has committed to spiritual evolution, who is in, on the path to the higher, even in such a person, the senses are turbulent, very powerful, indeed forcibly carries away the mind. So the senses are attracted to something and the mind is not cautious, it could be carried away. You remember the example, the metaphor we gave, how should we function in the world, like what? Like a tortoise. A tortoise is one that goes about in this world, but the moment it senses danger, it quickly withdraws itself and comes under the protection of the hard shell. The hard shell is nothing but the ability to think, to reason, to understand, to judge, to discriminate. Irrespective of what the feelings are, irrespective of what the physical challenge is, you come under the protection of your own intellect. And the intellect will protect you only if it's strong. And to make the intellect strong, you need to study. It's not intelligence. You remember yesterday we talked about the difference between knowledge and wisdom. Everybody has knowledge. Everybody is smart. You are successful in your own field because you're intelligent. You're smart. About what? About some subject that deals with the world. All your smartness, all your intelligence will not help you think clearly. Rabindranath Tagore, he says, the world is full of sound scholars, but not sound men. The world is full of sound scholars, intelligent people, smart people, successful people. You're scholars, proficient in your own field. You may be so, but you're not necessarily a sound human. You're not necessarily made up of character. You need character to keep you going all the time. See, on one hand, you have Rabindranath Tagore. On the other hand, you have a basketball coach, John Wooden, a famous basketball coach, American ba basketball coach. He says, see, ability can take you to the top. There you are. Ability can take you to the top. Your intelligence, your smartness can take you right to the top, but it takes character to keep you there. You want to stay on top, you've got to have character. And character has to be built. It doesn't come overnight. No matter who you are, no matter which family you belong to, no matter what your education is, character building is something else. It doesn't depend on your family background. Because people say, I come from a good family. So what? Family is good. You are not good. I come from this educational background. Education is good. You are not good. So you don't depend. You can't rely on your background. You cannot rely on anything other than your own intellect. That is your character. So your character has to be built Thought by thought, just as a building is put up brick by brick. If anything does, is not made up of solid material in this building, it will not stand. Similarly, if you have one wrong thought, one wrong feeling, your character is finished. You have a weak character. So it's no point rising and rising and getting to the top. You, greater the rise, greater the fall. But what will keep you on the top is character building. And that is built thought by thought, feeling by feeling, action by action. That's what we saw yesterday. What is karma? What is bhakti? What is jnana? Nothing but character building. You've got to build your character with every action. Check. Is my action selfish, unselfish, selfless? You've got a choice. Even as you sit here, 
This is an action. You could be sitting here because I want to benefit from this. Highly self-centered. I'm not saying you should not. At least do that. Please be selfish. Others should thank God you told me I'm not coming back tomorrow. It's thinking about yourself at the cost of others. That is selfishness. Then when you can accommodate, I am coming here because my family will be benefited. Only thing you can think of is me, my husband, my wife, my children. Everybody else, I don't know. I can't see. I've got cataract, I can't see. That sort of a indifference towards anything beyond your immediate interest takes you away from that discipline of your actions. You've got to convert your, your actions from selfish, unselfish to selfless. Yes, you could be sitting here because I believe I can learn something by which I can become a better human. I'm not perfect. And I understand there is such a thing as perfection. There is a meaning to being human, to be born a human. I must understand whether I'm a good human. And can I be a better human? That goal itself changes your action from ordinary to extraordinary. From selfish, self-centered, to being unselfish, to selfless. I'm only mentioning this because it's not that simple. We, you know, we talked about effort. This is that workout. Am I performing right action? So just because you sit in a lecture, a Bhagavad Gita lecture, does not make your action selfless. It depends on why you're doing it, how you're doing it. What is the purpose? Benefit yourself? It's a highly selfish attitude. Why do we go to a temple and pray? Oh God, if you do this for me, I will break 100 coconuts. Why? I must be benefited. Maximum my family. Take care of my family. Neighbor's family, let them go to hell. But my family, you must take care. And if that doesn't happen, oh God, what happened to you? So you go for reminders. Why do you go back to the temple? God will forget you. And the strangest thing that happens, particularly in Indian homes, you must go to the puja room. It's clustered with all the possible deities. Why? Because you're afraid. If I don't put the picture of this God, if he gets angry, what will happen to me? Huh? And another thing is where to place. If I put higher, then that God will think, he put that one higher. Okay, then you pray to him. Forget me, I will not uh, help you. Such a commotion in the puja room. It's a cluster. So many gods and goddesses because you're mortally afraid. If I don't worship them equally, what will they do to me? This attitude is to serve yourself. You're not going to a temple to be grateful for what they've already given you. No, you want something more than what you've already got. It's constant beggary. It's constant asking when you've already received so much. That's why bhakti, remember we talked about Abu Ben Adam? It's, it's that feeling of oneness that helps you develop that feeling of devotion. We're all here together. Nobody is different from the other. Everyone has a place in this world. Nobody is big, nobody is small. Nobody is good, nobody is bad. But each one has a nature. Each one has a place. You've got to learn to have that feeling of oneness with everyone. That feeling of oneness is bhakti. And of course, followed by gratitude for what you've already got, what you're already enjoying blissfully unaware, bhakti. So you've got to ensure your feelings are pure and then your understanding that there is but one truth and I'm here to get back to my original state, which is the truth, which is the reality. If you are doing all these three, you are well on the path to getting back to your original state. Continue with 61. 
Sarvani Sarvani Samyamya Yukta Asita Matparaha Vashehi Yasyendriyani Tasya Pragna Pratishthita Having controlled them all, he should sit focused on me as supreme. His wisdom is well established indeed, whose senses are under control. Now it's very interesting to know the flow of thought. If you recall, in the previous verses, 51, he talked about buddhi yoga. Buddhi yoga, what we have just discussed. He talks about the path of knowledge as we have also talked about the path of action and the path of devotion. These are the three disciplines that will help you offload desires. Your vasanas, vasanas are unmanifest desires. You offload your desires with these disciplines. That was 51. And then you come to a state of nirvedam, meaning a state of disinterest, mental withdrawal. And we cautioned everyone at that point. It doesn't mean you lose interest in your family. You lose interest in your business. You don't know how to enjoy life. It's not that. You don't have an exaggerated value for anything. You understand everything has its value in your life. But you will never be slave to anything. Nobody or nothing in this world can buy you up because you know it has a limited value. You give it the right value. That is the state of nirvedam. And then he says, when you have achieved that state, you are qualified to first of all concentrate. You remember the diagram we gave? Uh, you will say that was two days ago, how to remember that? Okay, I'll put it up, here you are. So these are the three disciplines Jnana Yoga is Buddhi Yoga, Karma and Bhakti, these are the three disciplines which we have just discussed. So every thought, every feeling, every action, you got to check. That is the discipline you follow. You reach a state of Uparati. Uparati or Nirvedam, these are all synonyms. A mental withdrawal, just as what is your attitude towards toys as an adult. You don't have value for toys will laugh at it. But if your little one comes and says, play with me, or your niece or nephew says, come and play the, with the toys on a Sunday morning, you won't say, I don't play with toys. You won't say that. You will go and entertain the child playing the toys, having zero value for it. But the child has tremendous value for the same toys. But that is the difference between a child and an adult. What makes you different from the child? You have grown out of that state. You have matured. The child is still caught up in that world. So this is that mental withdrawal we are talking about. Now you have tremendous value for name, fame, money, position, status, family. I don't know what all you have values for. So that will become your toy world which you can't get away from. But with these disciplines, even with reference to your present values, you develop that mental withdrawal as an adult has towards a child's world. If you reach that state and continue, don't give up these disciplines, karma bhakti jnana, then you get to a state of dharana, concentration, and we've already analyzed it is almost impossible for anyone to have concentration, even in this classroom. But it's understood. Nobody can concentrate one and a half hours. Not possible. It mind goes. You sit for 10 minutes, you enjoy the lecture, suddenly it goes. Where it goes, I don't know. You know where it's going. What do we do after 8 o'clock? Now unnecessarily I put the thought. <laughs> You'll start thinking. Where do we go? Correct, where do we go? I've lost you. So you'll go for five minutes somewhere that you want to go and then come back. This is lack of concentration. And that happens because we have still not gone through these exercises continuously. We don't do it. 
a few days now after the lecture, everybody will be all geared up and say, you know, we must study every day. And you ca catch hold of your friend and say, you wake me up in the morning, I'll wake you up in the morning, and you have a plan. How long will it last? Three days. That's all. Come back to square one. Get up at 8 o'clock. Go through the same motions. Till the next occasion to meet somebody or do something and pep yourself up. So there's no consistency. If you have consistency, you will reach that state of concentration. You put yourself anywhere, any situation, any circumstance, and you are sharp. You're like a razor's edge. You will not be distracted by anything in this world. Otherwise, every little thing, somebody, you just turn your head, somebody smiles, you also smile. In this room, it's happened. Why? Distracted. Let that person smile. Why are you wasting your time? But you will be distracted. Then you will look the other side. Somebody else is smiling. That, that person you look at. Something, you're fidgety, can't concentrate because there is no focus. There's nothing you want to achieve. If you want to achieve something, you will focus. So if you still practice, then you come to meditation. You qualify for meditation. So this we've already studied. 51, 52, 53, we've already studied that. Now again in 61 he's saying, come back to this verse. You can connect the two now. Having controlled them all, what? The senses. You got to start with physical discipline. If you are not disciplined physically, forget mental discipline. Only when you have completely controlled your senses, you can sit focused on me. See, when Krishna says me, when any master uses first person singular, it is not Mr. Krishna this height, this weight. It's not the personality Krishna. Krishna is representing the truth, the reality, the ultimate state of perfection. He's only a symbol. So you can cancel me and put the truth, the reality there. So he says, only when you are disciplined, which I've already explained the discipline, can you sit, should you sit, in meditation, focused on me as supreme means in the state of meditation. His wisdom is well established indeed, whose senses are under control. Now you understand, he has given so much importance to sense control, physical discipline as a prerequisite to meditation. I'm deliberately stretching this explanation because the whole world is practicing meditation without preparation. You may ask why? Because it's the simplest thing that can be taught. In few minutes I can demonstrate what is meditation. But whether you are meditating or not is a completely different question. You can sit like Lord Buddhas and pose. Even an actor who's being filmed beautifully, looks so peaceful. He looks like Lord Rama himself or Lord Krishna. Look at his personal life. His personal life could be a mess. He could be divorcing his wife in personal life. But on the screen, he is enacting Lord Buddha and you're so convinced what a peaceful face he's got. What a handsome person he is. What is going on inside, nobody knows. I'm not criticizing. Remember what we said? In this classroom, we do not criticize. In this classroom, we are analyzing. So this could happen because there is no inner discipline. Unless you have that control, starting with the physical body, you are not qualified to sit on the seat of meditation, not according to me. This is what the Gita is saying. Find out for yourself. So his wisdom is well established, whose senses are completely under control. Dhyayato vishayan pumsah Sangaste shupajayate Sangat sanjayate kamah Kamat krodho bhijayate 
क्रोधाद्भवति सम्मोह सम्मोहात् स्मृति विभ्रमः स्मृति भ्रमशाद बुद्धि नाशः बुद्धि नाशात प्रणश्यति These two verses are taken together because they have a flow of thought otherwise it, one verse would be incomplete it talks about the ladder of fall or the fall of a human being how does a human being fall why does a human being fall you know i told you yesterday if you open the papers you hear of scandals all sorts of scandals person has come to this problem this is what a report a investigation is going on some sort of wrong deeds have happened and a person has managed to amass a lot of wealth all sorts of things are happening and then an investigation goes on how did it happen so whether it's right or wrong we're not going to the merit or demerit we're not saying that but why does a person lead himself to that situation how does that happen why does that happen and you would sympathize and say why should have why should he throw away a life he's thrown away a good career unnecessarily getting into the scandal you wonder why now he's telling you it's a universal phenomenon why this happens to anybody why does a human being fall how does it all start this is a ladder of fall he says a man musing on objects develops attachment for them from attachment arises desire from desire arises anger and then he continues in the next verse from anger arises delusion from delusion confusion of memory from confusion of memory loss of intellect from loss of intellect he perishes he succumbs he is destroyed he falls but what is interesting to note here is the first point musing on objects it could be anything it could be fame i want to be famous i want to be big i want to make a lot of money nothing wrong with the thought why not if you can make it big make it big make it bigger biggest nothing wrong with the thought but what happens is if any thought goes unpoliced unguided unattended if you do not look into every single thought of yours every single feeling every single action if you let it take its own course you do not know where it will lead you that is the problem so this ladder of fall means a thought goes unchecked you're not checking it and as a human being you have no choice you have to check if you don't check it will boomerang see in life you all have the freedom to do whatever you want who can prevent you i want to do it i'll do it who are you to tell me what i should do of course nobody can tell you you have all the freedom to do whatever you want you have all the freedom to think the way you want you have all the freedom to feel the way you want but you have no freedom when it comes to the result the consequence of whatever you have done whatever you have thought whatever you have felt thereafter it's meeting the consequence and that's why sometimes we throw up our arms and say oh god why have you done this to me why me why are you troubling me what have i done you are facing the consequence of your own action your own thought your own feeling it's no point declaring to the world i do charity i take care of people you know how much of service i'm doing in this world remember we said it's like your bank account you go to the bank and say hey what happened to my balance the manager will say we are maintaining accounts you kept on withdrawing you've come to nil you can't go and argue with the bank manager or the accountant there are i put in so much how can you say it's nil 
because you kept drawing your own account. You kept debiting. If you keep on debiting your account, it will come to nil. Similarly, in your spiritual account, first of all, there's no account. You've not opened the account. <laughs> Hopefully, we start opening that account. And then you put in effort. So you put in effort. The moment you're selfish, it's debit. Any action, any thought, any feeling that is self-centered, it's a debit. So your balance is what you're facing in life. Whatever you face in life, good, bad, or indifferent, is the consequence of your own actions, feelings, thought. Therefore, friends, you got to take responsibility of your own life. Don't blame the stars. They have nothing to do with your life. And people go to the roadside and ask a fellow to read his the palm. Pathetic sight. A fellow is an illiterate. You give him few chiller, you know, paisa, something you throw and say, read my future. You believe he can read your future? Ask him. Amazing, amazing. What? The fall of the human intellect. There is no intellect. That's why Swamiji wrote a book, a whole book to tell us how much we have fallen. And people, okay, not the fellow, even that is a human being you're asking. Then people go and watch a parrot pick up a card and say, this is your future. And you believe it. You actually believe it. You base your life on a card picked up by a bird. That is why they say you got a bird brain. You actually believe it. And now you're not satisfied with birds. You've gone, where, what do people look for for the future? Does anybody know here? Who do you consult? Tarot. Those are the cards, right? Something else now. You've gone somewhere else. Who said that? Huh? Who do you consult? Who do people consult? Astrology and all is just too scientific for you. Octopus. Somebody has gone. Octopus. Octopus. You are consulting an octopus for your future? Whether you will win or lose? This is the state of of the human mind. You know, we are laughing because perhaps we are not doing it ourselves. But people genuinely believe, genuinely believe that if you consult, you will know your future. And the only person who can ever know his future is yourself. What have you done? What are you doing with yourself? That will determine your future. Remember what we said. Future is the continuation of the past modified in the present. That is your future. So if you've had a bad past, but you're willing to put in the right effort, you got a future, a bright future. If you had a good past, but you are putting negative efforts now, you're being selfish, self-centered, it's a question of time, it'll be a fall. So your future is in your hands now. So if you put in the right effort, you have a life ahead of you. If you don't put in effort, no matter what the stars, no matter what the birds you consult, no matter who you consult, you can never correct it. So friends, it starts with a thought. Dhyayataha means it starts with a thought. Like a bacteria enters your system. See, when you say, I've got a fever, how did you get a fever? For the past few days, the bacteria's the bacteria that entered your system started multiplying. And when they multiply to an extent, you succumb to the infection and you get a fever. But when the bacteria enter your system, you are not aware that you're under attack. Your system is under attack, you're not aware. It's only when you succumb, you know, I've got a fever. It enters you without your knowledge and starts multiplying. 
That is what he's saying. Dhyayataha. The thought comes into you and starts multiplying. If it starts multiplying, the next stage is Sangaha, attachment. So when you have attachment, you are comfortable when that object is around, when that person is around. You're uncomfortable when that person or object is not around. That is attachment. There's a sense of comfort or discomfort. If you still encourage the thought without checking, am I doing the right thing? Is this correct for me? If you don't do that, then you develop a desire, kamaha. Now it's not comfort or discomfort. Now there is a clear plan. I must get this object. I must get this person and enjoy. I must enjoy the company of the person or I must enjoy that object. Now it's a definite plan to procure and enjoy. Next step, if you still encourage the thought, the thinking without any logic, without any reason, you're just in a mad flow of thought towards that object or person, unchecked, if it goes on and you encourage it, you come to a stage of sammohaha, sammoha. First of, I'm sorry. First of all, krodaha. You develop anger towards anything that disturbs your flow of thought. So you have a desire now. If somebody comes and disturbs that desire, you get angry. Anything that comes your way. A lady wants her home to be clean. Is that wrong? You'll say, what is wrong? You have a desire for cleanliness. Okay. But if it's a mad attachment, you're not checking the desire, if you're not reasonable, you expect everybody to keep the house clean. So even if guests come into the house, if your husband has invited guests, your intention, why? Will they keep the place clean? My crystal is there. Will they knock it down? Will they keep the, ah, they're keeping the glass there. It's going to stain the glass. You constantly you're frowning because you don't know who's doing what. You're not enjoying the get-together. You can't enjoy because you're attached. You've got the desire for cleanliness. Then if you see people are not keeping up to it, you'll tell your husband, I told you not to call these people. Look at the way they're behaving. Can't you control your friends? Look at the way they're behaving. You get angry with the person because your desire for cleanliness is disturbed. You've got to be reasonable. What have you built the house for? Showcase? People will come. Things will be destroyed. Now, that doesn't mean you go to the other extreme and become indifferent towards cleanliness. See, two extremes are very easy to understand. To be totally indifferent, to be obsessed, both are easy because there's no effort. But to give it the right balance, yes, we should be careful. If something is so precious to you, take it away. Don't be under tension because people may come and destroy something inadvertently. It's possible. You can't control everybody's movement. So if you're particular about something, take it away. But if you feel, no, this is meant for display, it's an impermanent thing. Someday it has to break. Someday something has to happen. You will not come under pressure. That means that desire is checked. But if it is unchecked, then you succumb to the next problem, which is anger. If you still don't check, you fall into the next state, which is delusion. Delusion means confusion. What are you protecting for what? You're fighting with the family. You're fighting with this for what? One desire to be clean. You will have a quarrel with your family members for, if you boil it down, it is something silly. It is something stupid for which you have created a mountain of a molehill for nothing. So you're completely confused. You don't know what to go for, what to give up. There is delusion, lack of thinking, confusion. And if you still continue to follow your own desires, your own thoughts unchecked, then there is a loss of basic understanding. Who are you? Where are you? Who are you arguing with? What a mess you're making out of yourself. Ask yourself. There's a total 
loss of memory, confusion. And when you still continue, you lose your ability to reason. You lose your ability to apply logic. You lose your ability to think. And that leads you to complete destruction. See, one way of understanding this whole, we have the chart here, so it makes it easy for you. It's like a fall, you know? It's like a steps. It all starts with a thought. If you don't check the thought, is it right or wrong? Is it okay to continue? It develops into attachment. That's your comfort zone. If the things are there, you're comfortable. If it is not there, you're uncomfortable. So the lady, the servant comes to clean the house, you're comfortable. I'm, I'm still on the subject of cleanliness. It's a good thought. But if you are obsessed with that, if the servants don't come, you're very upset. Why? You can't keep the house clean. So that attachment, everybody is there, it's comfortable. Otherwise, you're terribly uncomfortable. If you still continue, you develop a desire, I must have this house clean at any cost. And all of you, my family members, understand, it must be done, the desire. So you, when the desire is interrupted, they say, you know, the, especially teenagers, mom, that's your problem. We can't be bothered about that. You say, see, see how these people behave? After all that I've done for them, they don't even care for me. They don't even care. Then she appeals to the husband, said, look, I'm busy, I have to go to office. See, you also don't care. That's why these children are like that. Big thing starts in the morning because of one desire for cleanliness, right? So then you get angry, and then there's delusion, there's confusion, you don't know what you're talking, you're blowing out of proportion, unnecessarily creating a scene there, and then you forget who you are, you don't know where you are talking, what you're talking, to whom you're talking, hurting people's feelings, all sorts of things. You lose your memory, loss of intellect, you, do, you lose your ability to reason fairly, to judge correctly, to decide sensibly, you lose all that then it is total destruction. So what you can do now, now that we have told the, there's a ladder of fall, when the first thought comes, check. Suppose you've forgotten, you're not in disciplined enough to check. At least when it comes to attachment, why am I feeling this comfort zone only when certain things are there? Why am I feeling uncomfortable when it's not there? Shouldn't be, I shouldn't be dependent. Why am I dependent? You should think. It's like, at any stage, you should catch it and correct it. Imagine a ball going down a flight of stairs. Suppose you're holding a ball and it slips from your hand. Quickly hold it. If you are not quick enough, it goes to step one. At least there you hold it. If you are not sharp, if you're not alert, it goes to step three. You need to stretch and hold it. If you're still negligent, knowing that the ball has slipped from you, it will next go to step five. You've got to be an athlete to run for it and pick it up. If you're still negligent, it goes to step 15, 25, 50, you lost it. It's gone, the ball is gone. So all that they're saying is, pick this up in the very beginning. Don't let it lead you to your own fall. Any thought, any desire, any attachment that goes unchecked, at some stage you can realize where you are. The way to understand it is agitation. Any form of agitation means you are at some stage which is not recommended. Desire will agitate you, unfulfilled desire. Attachment will agitate you. Anger is agitation. Not to talk of delusion, not to talk of loss of memory. Every part of it is more and more agitations. That's all it is. So you got to, instead of correcting the person or the object outside of you, look within and take hold of yourself. You can, you can save yourself from total destruction. When he says total destruction, nothing happens to you. You continue with your same family, same office, everything continues. But you lose your peace of mind. You lose your mental fitness. You lose your mental health. You become weak. And once you become weak, 
you don't know how to function in this world effectively. Next verse. Raga dvesha viyuktaistu Vishaya nindriya ischaran Atma vashya irvidhe yatma Prasada madhi gachhati A very important verse, please make note. Those who are here are fortunate because here he gives us the very formula, the very mechanism of self-control. What is that? He said, you must control the senses. Now, what is that control? He has not told till now. And here he gives the mechanism of self-control. I would like to share one part of this particular verse. You know, Swamiji, I have told you, there are books here, even the commentary on the Bhagavad Gita is written by Swamiji. And it's not a marketing strategy I'm using now, but you need to know the value of what we are talking. This particular verse, he took several months to analyze. And it's up to you, you can take up any book and make a comparison and find out what is the explanation that is given for verse 64 of chapter 2, because it gives us two types of control. See, the, the Sanskrit word that is used, he says, atma vashaihi, which is self-control, and vidheyatma, that is also self-control. Now, why these two words? This is not to make it very flowery and have literary value to show how much Sanskrit the author knows. It has a definite purpose. That took a lot of time to find out, which is very simply going to be told to you today. But it's up to you to find out if you can get that meaning from any other place. Not to challenge, but to make you understand that I did tell you this is a systematic study. From day one, I've been telling you that. See, when you go to a doctor, it's a qualified doctor who has gone through a systematic study of medicine. Then you give yourself to that person and say, treat me. When you want legal advice, you go to a qualified lawyer because he has gone through the systematic study of law. So you can take his advice. But if you go to a fellow on the roadside and say, advise me what I should do legally, you will be in trouble because he doesn't know law. He has not studied it. Similarly, in the spiritual field, you can just pick up any book because it's on the shelf, because it looks good. I got this Gita because the cover is very good. The print is very good. But what is the content is the question. And this explanation should give you an idea of how much has gone in to explain the mechanism of self-control. So what he says here is, but the self-controlled man, free from likes and dislikes. Number one, free from likes and dislikes. Raga dvesha viyuktaihi. Then he says, moving among objects with his senses under control. Vishayan indriyaihi charan atma vashyaihi. With the senses under control, he is moving amongst sense objects. So two controls are given. No explanation is given. What do we mean by these two controls? Such a person alone attains peace. So there are two types of controls here. Number one, when he says, Raga dvesha viyuktaihi, he means we all have likes and dislikes. That is the mind. The mind is nothing but a sum total of all your wishes, your wants, your likes, your dislikes, your desires, your demands. Everything put together is anybody's mind. Even the mind of a saint has the same things, same content. Then what is the difference between a saint and an ordinary person? A saint, a sage, a wise person is one who has the mind completely under control of what? What controls the mind? Anybody? Huh? Intellect. intellect. The intellect is the adult in you. The mind is a child in you. Even in a full grown, mature, successful adult. Mind is still a child. 
when we say that it will ask for anything it can like anything it will want anything any place anyhow you can't tell the mind why do you want this why do you want that is the mind but it is up to your intellect to direct your mind so when you act in the world he says first control is let not these likes and dislikes guide your actions then what must guide your actions whether you like it or not choose the right action according to your intellect you may not like physical fitness you may not like to get up in the morning and exercise you dislike it but if you act on your dislike if you act on your like you will not be leading yourself to being a better human then what must decide i don't like to get up but i know it's good for me i will do it so you are not permitting your likes and dislikes to guide your actions that's the first discipline second he says why he says that is because you have a choice you can either follow your mind and justify i like it i will do it i can afford it you can afford to destroy yourself also it's up to you so you can make yourself you can destroy yourself you can be born in the best of circumstances and make a mess out of your life you can be born in the worst of circumstances and make a glorious life for yourself choice is yours so if you choose to follow your likes and dislikes you destroy yourself it's a question of time if you choose to follow your intellect however tough it is however difficult it is however uninteresting it is however challenging it is if you choose to follow your buddhi it's a question of time you will have that mastery over your own personality you build your character that's how to do it second he says moving among sense objects so people believe self control is self denial i shouldn't do this i shouldn't do that and now we are round the corner new years new year resolution i've been partying too much i should party less or i've been drinking too much i should drink less i've been smoking too much i should smoke some new it will not work it will end with the new year's day stop maximum 2 3 days you will do it then we get back to square one and do it with greater force because you've already denied yourself for so long with a frustration you will do it so it's not suppression self control is not suppression it's not self denial it is an intelligent regulation of your own actions according to your intellect that is self control so nobody else controls you except yourself that's the way to go this is the most important part of the verse so he says you're moving amongst objects the world has been beautified for you to enjoy not for donkeys and uh, monkeys they can enjoy the world technology is come for you no animal can enjoy it so why are you denying yourself when you can ride in a beautiful car why would you go in an ordinary car and you can afford it so self control is not getting away from the world running away from enjoyment there is no limit to it oh that means i must have one car not two or i must have an ordinary house not a you've got your own concepts about what should what is right for you as much as you can afford what's wrong nothing wrong with that even then you are practicing self control king janaka was a king a man of self control because he followed the discipline so what is the discipline is moving amongst objects with senses under control indriyas are under control now i'll show you a diagram which explains this concept it's again not in the original text i did tell you it took several months before swami ji could bring up this diagram to make it easy for us to understand now what you see here is represents the mind this mind is not in that shape please this is only a diagram so don't go about saying the mind is oval and uh, it's just a diagram to represent the mind okay so this is the mind and housed in the mind are your likes and dislikes this is where your likes and dislikes are 
and also you have the sense centers represented by C1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Why 5? Because you have five senses. Eyes, ears, nose, tongue, skin. And here, the bottom, you have O1, 2, 3, 4, 5. They represent the respective objects of the senses. So the eye is attracted by sights. The ear by sounds. Nose, smell. Tongue, taste. Skin, touch. This is what the world is offering you. All these objects are offered by the world outside. So the object, sight, enters your eye and gets registered in the sense center of your mind. When that happens, you register sight. You enjoy sight. Oh, what a beautiful place when you say that. It has registered in your mind. When you say, what lovely food we had today, means the taste passed your tongue and was registered in the sense center in your mind. If this does not happen, you cannot taste, you cannot see, you cannot hear. If it does not reach your mind, have you not seen a boy maybe reading a book? He's engrossed in the book. The mother's calling out to him, better come, dinner, dinner served, better come, dinner served. He's not even responding. Then the mother says, goes up to him and says, are you deaf? I've been calling you for so long. Huh? Sorry, you called me? When did you call me? See, he's not deaf. He has heard. But the sound did not register in the mind. Why? Mind was preoccupied with something else, reading the book. Now, usually that happens between husband and wife. <laughs> That's why they say the best marriage is between a blind wife and a deaf husband then they have a peaceful marriage. But if that uh, man can hear, the lady goes on talking, she gets upset. And if the lady sees what all he's doing, she gets upset. So best marriage, blind wife, deaf husband. But he may choose to be deaf. That is the problem. He has heard, but he doesn't, he pretends not to hear. Then comes the problem. But as long as the sound reaches your sense center, that enjoyment is complete. Now what happens? After reaching the sense center, the mind starts. These likes and dislikes are. It was so nice. It was so nice. When can we meet again? When can we go again to the same restaurant? I think next month, all of us will go again, okay? So unnecessarily, after the enjoyment is complete, you have satisfied the desire, but you will start reliving that enjoyment and now you want to have that more and more. And since you want to have it more and more, you got to have enough money to have that enjoyment again, which means you have to earn. The whole cycle is set. The more desires you have, the more you have to earn, the more you have to get into the cycle only to satisfy the desires. He says, that is a violation of self-control. Up to this point, you're fine. But the moment you start reliving that experience unnecessarily, if you need it, go and get it. That is not, that is not lingering. That is not violation of self-control. You got a plan, you understand this is good for you, and your intellect approves, and you go ahead and do whatever you want. That is fine. But a mechanical reliving, unnecessarily doing it, and encouraging further desires for the same enjoyment, you get caught in your desires for more and more, and that destroys your peace of mind. Because you will never be happy. You can have more and more and more, you will never be happy because you want some more. And that comes when you flout this mechanism of self-control. So two things, 
let not your likes and dislikes guide your actions choose your actions what must choose your actions is your intellect is this right for me should i do this you may be wrong but start using your intellect slowly it develops clarity so that is the first discipline and second discipline is moving amongst sense objects meaning you are acting in this world you're enjoying this world it's meant for you to enjoy let not your enjoyments carry you away and create fresh ripples of likes and dislikes and desires which will drag you into wanting more and more and destroy your peace if you observe these two he says you attain peace of mind next was prasade sarva dukhana hanirasyo pajayate prasanna chetaso hyashu buddhih paryavatishthate in peace all his sorrows are destroyed the intellect of the tranquil minded soon becomes steady now first of all in the previous verse he talks about self control that will give you peace of mind otherwise you'll be agitated because you'll want more and more you're never satisfied with what you have no matter what you have so living a life of discipline of self control helps you to enjoy life it doesn't take you away from enjoyment people believe oh if i lead a life of self control i lose my enjoyment in fact you truly enjoy when you are self controlled if you are not self controlled even as you are enjoying supposedly you are having a meal you are enjoying you are only worried will i have it again so your one part of your mind is gone you are not fully with it because you are anxious for something else or worried about how you lost it last time you can't really enjoy fully so you enjoy anything 60% 40% is gone we are only saying enjoy it 100% then your enjoyment itself is full if you lead a life of self control and what's more you have 100% enjoyment 100% peace no agitation because no strings attached no agendas just go experience to experience no lingering you finish one experience out you go next you finish that experience out you go next experience by experience point by point no lingering otherwise if while you're sitting here you're thinking of something else while you're sitting here thinking of the future you're never in the present so if what you have you don't enjoy somebody else enjoys it you remember we talked about the weddings who enjoys their own weddings their family weddings all the guests enjoy you don't even know what the food tasted like uh, you have paid the bills you have gone through so much of planning you have gone through so much nothing you enjoy so if you live a life of self control you enjoy 100% and you're peaceful now he says in that peace whatever you gain by that life of self control all your sorrows are destroyed you don't have any agitations that's why you're peaceful when you don't have mental agitations the intellect of a peaceful person tranquil minded person soon becomes steady sharp see we can demonstrate in a second suppose i say everyone for a moment be quiet instantly the intellect sharp what is happening why are we quiet suddenly you find a sharpness alert you become alert see even in a party when everybody is chit chatting chit chatting chit chatting one person takes the mic and says attention everyone may i have your attention please everybody is quiet when they are quiet you are sharp you are attentive so the way to make the intellect sharp is quietness peace of mind so he says when you lead a life of self control you are peaceful when you are peaceful the intellect becomes sharp 
alert. And if your intellect is sharp and alert, it can apply itself to action. Your actions become perfect because the intellect is available at all times. If your actions become perfect, you become successful. Remember we started this whole discussion with the two things that people are looking for. One is peace, other is success. How do you get both? People are either peaceful or successful, never the two. So the way to get both is the two verses put together. 64 helps you to lead a life of discipline. You enjoy the world fully. At the same time, you're peaceful. 65 tells you when you're peaceful, your intellect becomes sharp. You can apply that intellect and become successful in the world. Together, you get what any human anywhere in the world is looking for, peace and success. And this, these two verses, when you apply, see, self-control brings up peace of mind. Peace of mind brings a sharp intellect. When the intellect is sharp, you're wise to choose your actions well and live a life of self-control, it complements each other. They are like two pedals to a wheel which will take you all the way to human perfection. And even if you don't hit the hundredth mark, you are far, far better than where you are. Tomorrow is the last day. We will take up the remaining verses and conclude the series. Thank you.